and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, please stop having fun and sit down. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could uh, take your seat. And before things get violent, I want you to know that I, for seven years, I ran a bingo at a Catholic parish, so I know how to deal with loud, angry crowds. And I'm still alive. And I see some priests here. I even think, think I saw a bishop. Did I see a bishop? Who will tell you that if you run a, if you run a, a bingo, it absolves you of mortal sin for the rest of your life. So... I don't make, make fun of a Catholic sacrament, you'll, you'll forgive me. Bingo. So, uh, yeah, I, I have, a, my name is Jack Fowler, I'm the MC of the evening. I am a member of the board of the Human Life Foundation, a former employee of the Human Life Review, a great friend of Maria Mafucci. And Maria is here with her sister, Christina Angelopoulos, who's going to sing a well-known song. Who say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Through broad stripes and bright stars, through the perilous fight, o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. drama department, uh, I realized that Jack was very famous because of his huge personality and sense of humor, and he was dating a girl who was on TV commercials, so he was like, wow. Um, the sense of humor is only matched by his amazingly good heart, so I'm very grateful to Jack. So welcome, Your Excellencies Bishop Barris and Bishop Byrne, our honorees Helen, Alvare, and Rich Lowry clergy, sisters, and esteemed guests. We also have some past great Defender of Life honorees. Clark Forsyth is here. Um, and Suzanne Metaxas. And Eric, did you win that? Eric and Suzanne Metaxas together. Um, welcome to our 17th annual Great Defender of Life dinner. Isn't there something exhilarating about a large joyful celebration in the heart of New York City? We are part of the resistance. We stand against 
against the death leave policies of Governor Andrew Cuomo, who's been dubbed Governor Death by Ed Meckman. But this is an evening to honor heroes, and there are so many of you here. Helen, you have been and remain a rock star for us. You are a brilliant lawyer, dedicated scholar, formidable debater, fierce advocate. You are a role model for Catholic laywomen. You are a loving wife, and holding it all up, as you reminded us in your article to review, is your role as a mother to your children entrusted to you by God. My friend Destiny Herndon De La Rosa, who founded the New Wave Feminists, met you at Notre Dame last summer, and she was just awestruck. So I asked her what her reaction was, and this is what she said. Have you ever met someone so brilliant that you find yourself genuinely mad at the universe for not spreading what it is they have around more? It almost seems unfair that someone can be so intelligent, so articulate, so clever, and most audaciously so hilarious at the same time. That is Helen Alvarez, the type of person who makes you scream in the sky because she's ruining the curve for the rest of us. <laughs> but once the jealousy subsides, you realize just how lucky you are not only to share the planet with such a brilliant woman, but to have a chance to battle alongside her for the rights of the most vulnerable members of the human family. She is creating a roadmap for so many young women in the movement. She is an icon and our not-so-secret weapon against the lies and spin of those trying to exploit women and children in the name of false liberation. Rich. As you know, I grew up at National Review. I started working summers there at 13 because, yes, Dad believed in child labor. <laughs> and I have watched it thrive and keep to its principles under your leadership. In your columns and TV appearances, you combine a sharp intellect, a hearty political expertise with a deep understanding of the sanctity of human life as evident in the beautiful words about motherhood in your current article for the review. You wrote, even before her child is born, a mother and her family sacrifices for her child and dreams for her child. She talks to her child and often names her child. She takes her child to the doctor, her unborn child, in short, is already what it will be after he or she is born a cause of worry and joy and ceaseless wonder at the miracle of life. Bravo. The Human Life Foundation was born in the offices of National Review in 1974, and my late father, J.P. McFadden, could not have done it without his then partner in crime, Ed Capano, who is here tonight. My father's vision was to create an intellectual journal for the burgeoning pro-life movement. The late John Muggeridge said, the Human Life Review appeals to the intellect, and why not? The detail from Michelangelo's familiar picture, which Jim chose as HLR's logo, says it all. Those two almost touching hands proclaiming God having created man in his image, man's mind must in some way be an analogous to God's. So discovering the truth about human generation should therefore awaken reverence for human life. The review appeals to the mind. The foundation also gives from the heart. And from the beginning, we have raised support for crisis pregnancy centers across the country. This is so crucial now that we support them not only financially, but actively because they are under intense attack, especially here in New York, from pro-abortion politicians and the abortion industry. Amidst our joy at being together, we also share grief this evening. Our good friend and one of our founding editors, Michael Yulman, a great lawyer, author, and statesman, died two days ago of pancreatic cancer. To talk about his accomplishments, character, and his great heart would be a whole other dinner. And as a matter of fact, we tried to honor him, and he refused. 
He did, though, speak at our very first Great Defender of Life dinner in 2003 when we honored Henry Hyde, and he spoke in 2013 when we honored the great Judge Jim Buckley. Our hearts go out to his family and friends, many of whom are here tonight in the press. We're also sad to miss our board member, Father Paz Kowalski, who is ill and in the hospital, and I ask you all to pray for his recovery. So just a couple more notes. One, my friend, Francois Xavier Chalou, who sings with me in the choir at St. John and Paul in Larchmont, has created a wonderful sparkling rosé wine, which we are raffling off tonight because he generously donated a case. Um, it's an award-winning wine, and by the way, it's low sugar, fewer calories, and you get no headache from it. <laughs> So I have an invitation for those of you who are here as guests who are not yet with us. And I say, join us, we need you. And you need us. The most common remark we get when people discover us is, where have you been all our lives? In these days hostile to life for the pre-born, the just born, the elderly, and the disabled, we all need to be armed with facts, and bolstered by a community of the like-minded. We have that in abundance at the Human Life Foundation with the Human Life Review, our website, and our special events. So please look in the gift bags for a flyer with an opportunity to subscribe and support us. And now I would like to introduce Reverend Ross Blackburn, Rector of Christ the King Church in Boone, North Carolina review contributor and author of our wonderful regular column on our website, A Pastor's Reflections, to say our invocation. You'll, you'll hear that it's a humbling thing to be asked to speak before you all, probably from everyone up here, and it, it, it is, um, especially amongst um, <coughs> a fair number of you all who uh, <coughs> are, as Maria just said, our, our heroes. Um, I just met, just shook the hands of Helen and Rich, never met them before, but I've learned from both of you, and I'm thankful, and others of you in this room um, as well, Maria and the rest of you all, Anne and Christina and Rose, um, you have our gratitude and respect probably more than you know, maybe, maybe you do. And many of you in quiet ways, and maybe not so quiet ways, um, are, are walking faithfully um, in, uh, in the battle, if you will, that Maria just spoke about. Um, I've been asked to invoke God. That's what this invocation means. I thought about that. And what, 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 would that, what could that possibly mean? Um, because it sounds like a huge presumption that one would, would do that. Um, and it would be, except for two things. Number one, we invoke God because pro-life work is God's work. This is His work. Because at bottom, the pro-life movement is about the image of God. There, there really is no other reason why human beings are valuable. I mean, DNA might tell us why we're different from animals, but it can't tell us why we are special. Cognitive ability, creative ability, self-awareness, they may make us exceptional, but they can't make us valuable. And besides, all those things, as we know, can be stripped away or may never be realized in the first place. All we're left with is the image of God. In the vulnerable, in the weak, in the unborn, in the child or adult with Downs, and the Alzheimer's, the drug addict, the lonely, the wounded, the brain injured, you and me. In other words, in the end, what we have to commend ourselves is simply this, that we bear the image of God. The image of the one who had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. One despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and is one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So what do we have left when everything is taken away? We have the image of God. And that's enough. We love God by loving his image, and particularly the fatherless and the widow and the vulnerable. 
So that's the first reason we invoke God. This is His work. Secondly, we invoke God because we need Him. In some ways, it's an admission just doing that. And in pro-life work, we're in over our heads. And many of you know that far more deeply than I do. Many of us, and it's an increasing number, don't remember a time before legal abortion. Now, progress has been made, thanks be to God, in no small part because of many of you here. But it's been slow and more is needed. And so we pray. We pray for wisdom and perseverance. As many of us are weary. Our local crisis pregnancy center director in, in Boone emails me every week with prayer requests. And many of them just have to do with her and her staff. It's easy to get discouraged, easy to get confused. We pray for compassion, that God would grant that we would weep. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. We pray for forgiveness, for our participation, for our apathy, perhaps for our silence. We pray for healing for ourselves and that we might hold out to the one who by his stripes has offered healing to the world. We pray that we might see the beauty of God's image in every human being. In other words, we need him to be the kind of people he is calling us to be the kind of people that can defend the fatherless and plead for the widow, that love our neighbors, whoever they are. And perhaps success, at least in our day, isn't the end of legal abortion, but the identification of the church with the least in such a way that the church enters into the suffering of the vulnerable, which is the suffering of Christ. Only God knows. But our success, whatever that looks like, will not be determined chiefly by our faithfulness to the cause, but by our faithfulness to God. This is His work, and we can depend upon Him to see it through, which is really the good news in all of it, isn't it? Is that He will see it through because this is His work. In the end, the pro-life movement is a prophetic movement. Not only in proclaiming in word and in deed that God's image is held by those who the world would just as soon forget, but also in holding out Christ, who is healing for the broken, strength for the weary, forgiveness for the sinner, peace for the fearful, and a light in a world of darkness. And so we rightly invoke God, not just over our time together, but over the whole movement with which we and He are so rightly concerned. I want to end with two prayers. One, which I will pray finally, is, uh, was written by a man that uh, some of you in here know, and has been walking this road for 30 plus years. His name is Jim Pinto, and I um, mention him with gladness. He uh, very helpful for me, particularly in, 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 this, uh, in this way, understanding um, what's at stake here. So let us pray. Father in heaven, for the blessing of the Human Life Foundation and all who serve here, we thank you. Even as we ask for your further blessing upon their work. And for the grace to join you in your work here. For you are the father of the fatherless and the protector of the widow. Thank you for the blessing of food, of fellowship, of friendship, for those that have served us tonight. And all the good gifts and graces that are ours through your son, Jesus Christ. And now for, for Jim's prayer. Heavenly Father, I embrace your grace this day so that I might not think of another, speak to another, or touch another without first looking for your face in the other. I ask all this through Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God with skin, God made poor, God with a face. Amen. and gentlemen, I hope you've had an enjoyable meal so far. I am B11. 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 
how do you make a room full of Catholic women curse? Right? Somebody else, bingo. You're correct. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Or, well, hello. You haven't left. Uh, I've got some duties to do here. So the duties are, I've got to read some notes. Then I'm going to introduce sister, who's going to introduce Helen. Then I'm going to get back up. I'm going to introduce Catherine, who's going to introduce Rich. They're going to speak. And then I'm going to round this off with a, a announcing raffle winners, right? Right. Okay. Good. So, let's thank some people for this evening. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors. By the way, this is a fundraiser, right? <laughs> so, thank you to those of you who parted with your your cash and checks to help make this happen. But this this isn't what was to happen. It's the things that the review does which publishes and changes minds. That's the important thing that comes out of this evening. So thank you for that, uh, all who are here. But here are, the, here are the sponsors. They're in your program, but darn it. I'm good. Is that right if I say darn it, sister? I was thinking of socks. Um, I'd like to thank the Knights. Catherine's going to yell at me. Uh, the Knights of Columbus Supreme Council, uh, Dale and Wendy Brott, uh, the August, Robert Augustinelli Foundation, James and Joan McLaughlin, Catherine Dillon, Captain Michael and Mrs. Marianne Hayes, uh, George Marlin, Gregory Usani, Alan and Mary Roth. I want to make an Alan Roth joke, but Alan, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Uh, Walter and jo jo uh, Joanne Russell, Stan Town, Anonymous. There's two of them here. <laughs> uh, Dana and Ann Hendershot and Robert and Patricia O'Brien, thank you very much for your sponsorships of this evening. A special thanks to Relevant Radio for airtime. I didn't know we were on the radio. I have, a, I have a face for it. Um, for their airtime and the contributions to our guest bags. Folks, do you want to hear what's in the guest bags or not? Because that's why you're here. Admit it. It's the chocolate and the moleskin thing. They had me at moleskin. I thought it was Molson's, but uh, the uh, board of the Human Life Foundation. Wh where's our great chairman, James McLaughlin? There he is. Uh, the foundation's mighty staff. By the way, I was told to say mighty, small but mighty staff. Ann Conlin, Rose DeMeo. Christina Angelopoulos, the great singer, Ida Paz, and Jane Devani. And I want to mention also Dana Hendershot, Pat O'Brien, two of our great board members, along with uh, Father Kaz. And I think that's all my notes now. Tension, bingo joke, Good. Maria, friendship, make fun of sister. <laughs> I just met sister tonight and she had the privilege of sitting next to me for half an hour and she's she's still Catholic after that so it's a miracle and not a small one um, even my heathen friend Rich Lowry knows about my love of nuns is that correct I see nuns I melt Although I'm not exactly melting right right now but um, Peggy Meckman, I, I told you I was going to mention your name. Uh, we went to uh, St. Barnabas Grammar School in the Bronx, and one day, it, yes, 50, 50 something years ago, and one day, uh, it was a February day, a Sunday, there were about 20 nuns walking up 241st Street, and the wind was blowing, and it was just the most beautiful beautiful sight and for whatever reason that stuck with me and now whenever I see a nun in 
anywhere. I, I just feel like I accost them. And Catherine, do you remember that time? We were, Catherine Lopez and I were walking down 48th Street, and I saw a nun, it was a sister of life, walking the other way, and I got so excited. As we approached, the, the sister was excited, and I thought, but she was excited because she saw Catherine. So. <laughs> Catherine's a rock star in these communities. So, anyway, uh, hey, uh, Sister Bethany Madonna, why don't you come up here and you introduce Helen. Thank you, Jack, for sharing that beautiful image. It has been a privilege. This is an absolute joy uh, for me to have been um, invited to come and introduce Helen. Helen Alvarez has been a dear friend of the Sisters of Life since our inception in, in 1991 and uh, was so beloved of our father and founder, John Cardinal O'Connor. So uh, I feel privileged. I feel absolutely privileged um, to introduce her. I was remembering a few years ago while preparing for uh, Given, which was a Catholic Young Women's Leadership Forum, uh, Sister Mary Gabriel and I made a stop at uh, Helen's house and there sat at her kitchen table for hours. And I absolutely loved the scene. It was uh, in a, a home that is warm and welcoming, uh, well lived in, completely comfortable, or eating strawberries there at the table, splashes of color everywhere, an incredible library that I know Helen has read all of those books probably multiple times, papers, uh, computer in the den close by, and then wonderful interruptions through our, our, our meeting, you know, calling out to her wonderful husband Brian to remind her about something, um, her son dropping in with a friend and rifling for a snack in the kitchen, and there we were with our notebooks in hand as this friend and mentor uh, acted like she had all the time in the world for us. And she was musing and sharing her insights with that characteristic precision, thoughtfulness and wit, her glasses at the tip of her nose, it's my favorite, looking at each of us directly in the eyes, so playfully, um, honestly, she was completely free. This was a window into the heart of a woman who has found herself in losing herself for love of Jesus and his church. During his tenure as the chairman, Cardinal John O'Connor had Helen on speed dial, interrupting many a date night with her husband Brian to receive this same generosity of heart and clarity of thought she was offering to us uh, after she had accepted the position that we all know was created with her in mind to be the spokeswoman of the USCCB Pro-Life Secretariat, serving for over a decade. Like Joan of Arc, responding to a call to lead in an arena predominantly of men, uh, surely she also knows what it's like to feel burnt at the stake sometimes. And so, I later learned that one of Helen's favorite quotes is from St. John of the Cross, and she said this, quoting him, where there's no love, put love, and you will find love. Coming into the abortion debate in the 1990s was stepping into the heat of the battle, and you did just what St. John of the Cross said to do, Helen. You put a woman's love there. Uh, the love of a wife, a mother, an advocate, living true to the Catholic tradition of servant leadership. You were not only a voice for the voiceless, the vulnerable unborn, and their mothers, but you were a voice for those who felt themselves to be stifled and silenced by the cacophony of shouts. Your voice spoke words that were needed, and you did so articulately, unapologetically, clearly, and pointedly. Words that so many longed to hear, and from a woman on behalf of women everywhere. And just as a mother teaches her children how to talk, you do this as a professor, Helen, a professor of law. You have taught the next generation how to be an advocate, how to defend, how to proclaim the truth in the face of so many competing lies. Um, when I think about you and when I pray for you, Helen, I, I sense John the Baptist's intercession in your life, and it has nothing to do with his, you know, locust eating. Or, or, but it does have to do with his wildness. There is something wonderfully wild about you. 
Am I my brother's keeper? You better believe I am. You, you are a prophet in many ways, Helen. You have been a voice of one crying out in the wilderness to prepare a way for the Lord and to repent. And Jesus called John a burning and a shining lamp. And you are well named. Helen means torch. You are a lamp on a lampstand and a trailblazer for the next generation of women. <laughs> Sorry, I'm choking myself up. Tell me, really. Everything's fine. <laughs> Sorry, myself included. I'm looking for a model and a mentor. Uh, women who also feel impassioned and impelled to make a response of their life and love by upholding, cherishing, and safeguarding those sacred truths that are no longer held as self-evident. You have shown that being a defender of life is being a defender of marriage, being a defender of religious liberty, being a defender of the complementarity of the sexes, being a defender of the human person at every stage. The Bishop's Conference chose you, Helen, but the Lord chose you first, to love you and to be loved by you. He called you into being for such a time as this. And tonight we honor you and thank you for your yes to Jesus and for all of those entrusted to your maternal and fierce love. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. You know, I wanted to tell Sister Bethany she had me at hello. I mean, I would already do anything for the Sisters of Life. There was no need to put frosting on the cake, but I am beyond honored. The Sisters of Life, to me, and others I see here tonight, oh my goodness, Chris Bell and Joan, just are such heroes to me. It's just fabulous just to be in the same room with you and with them, and thank you so much. I. Um, I also want to thank Human Life Review, um, Maria, Anne, who I know so well, um, over years, um, and to my husband, Brian, um, who has put up with a lot of chaos, intensity, and just plain hard work of service in my being able to flit around the country and the world. As is well known at my house, all really fun stories from the kids start with, well, mom was away giving a pro-life talk. And <laughs> I'm not kidding. I think it's the start of every story. And everybody knows how that my husband is my conscience. Um, it may be outside of my brain, but he has earned a way into my brain. My, the story that we love to repeat, but is very true, is when I was working for Cardinal O'Connor at the Bishop's Conference. Um, it was a long, exhausting day. Um, someone had hatcheted through our front door. That's another story. Um, but anyway, we were going to buy a new front door. And we go to Home Depot, and they have, they're trying to sell me a metal door. And I said something to the guy, to the equivalent of, what don't you get about, I'm not getting a door for a prison here. This is my house. I want a wood door. And my husband leans in ever so gently and says something to the effect of, after a hard day of shutting down abortion clinics, Helen Alvary likes to beat up up on the working poor. <laughs> so, and that is only one of his many witticisms. He is, um, I'm just saying, he's got like three of them a day. He's amazing. Um, so I thank him in particular. And I'm honored to be here for many reasons, but among them two are the top. One is that I am convinced, because I've now lived through it, that the pro-life movement is one of the great and persistent human rights movements in history. And second, <laughs> second is that the Human Life Review is its intellectual crown jewel, especially for people like me who lead with our heads. It's not that I'm heartless. <laughs> I just don't lead with my heart. I just want to make that clear. And to have the kind of intellectual firepower that the pro-life movement has always had, we need it. We're always in the midst of environments where we are made to feel stupid, anti-intellectual, that our position is absolutely an impossibility for people with our background or education or in the milieu where we are traveling. And Human Life Review 
lets us all know that, it, that we're in the company of friends even when we don't have the privilege of being together like we are tonight and we are so grateful for it. always in, despite the fact that I'm out there all the time, and I'm, we refer to it as a high wire act with a flaming trapeze, <laughs> so I think of it, uh, despite the fact that I'm, I'm regularly out in media and academic circles, I find myself in desperate need of being reminded constantly, because I'm being told constantly that the position is anti-intellectual, it's anti-feminine, etc., in constant need of the kind of arguments and, and people and language and logic and genius that is printed in the Human Life Review. So I just thought tonight I would offer sort of two comments about what I'm seeing out there right now in the context of a debate that we are trying to have as a rational and intelligent debate, uh, but having a little trouble stirring up that level of conversation. Um, I have been working in the, you know, pro-life arena, if you will, really since the late 80s. I was the general counsel to the pro-life committee of bishops, and then they asked me to come in and do the sort of national spokesperson thing. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I've observed how it's changed over time. And what I have noticed most of all now, and maybe you know, a lot of you have been in the thick of this every day as well, is just an absolute lack of rationality at all. <laughs> and, and, un, and an unwillingness to, to enter onto that plane. And I just want to share an example with you. I was in Vermont giving a talk at, I think it was called St. Michael's College. I think I might, my, like, where I was last week or the week before is always a question <laughs> with me. I'm like, where was I? I think it was in St. Michael's, and I'm going to say it was in Burlington. And there were some um, pro-life folks from Vermont Right to Life who came up to me and said, we cannot find a lawyer in Vermont who will help us. There is no one who will testify on our behalf. And I said, well, I'm leaving tomorrow, and I'm sorry, I don't really have time. And she goes, please, please. And you know, this is pro-lifers, they're great. They're like, you know, you're trying to roll up the window, and they're sticking things in going, this will help. You need to read this. I mean, don't we all know that? that that's our persistence, that kind of annoying thing that makes us live for all these decades. And she just slips me a folder and says, read, read what the other side is testifying. And so I read it, and sure enough, she, she had me. Um, what they were arguing was that they were arguing in these broad conclusory statements that, that any restrictions on abortion were life-threatening to women, that women's health absolutely required abortion as a, you know, a treatment in order to promote women's health. For their footnotes, they were citing blog summaries of um, newspaper articles about studies done by the Bixby Center for Reproductive Rights at the University of, Southern, of California at San Francisco. That was their empirical data, okay? And I had a feeling when I saw these studies, they were called the turnaway studies, and they were claims about what happened to women who were turned away from abortions because they went to a clinic after the weeks at which the abortion clinic was willing to perform an abortion. And I looked at the studies and right away, you know, having read this stuff for decades, my antenna went up. I went and looked at not the blog posts, not the newspaper articles, but I read the actual studies. It was a stunning display of primary source using. <laughs> and, uh, and what you find is the following. 82% of the women they followed dropped out of the study. And we know that women who are more troubled by abortion drop out of studies, number one. Number two, they had no idea if any of the women who were denied abortions had abortion elsewhere or later. So the categories of women they were studying who, quote, didn't have abortions might very well have had abortions. Number three, we saw that the study said, we actually don't claim any causation here. It's far more likely that women who have chaotic lifestyles or some other difficulties in their life both miss the deadline, even at late-term abortion clinics, and also suffer other difficulties later in their life, which, are, which may or may not be related to actually having the children they did not abort. Number four, when the researchers were asked to share their data, they refused. They refused to share their questions, their cross tabs, the results, or anything with independent researchers who wanted to verify it. 
Then they made all these broad claims about women's place in the educational system, in, the, in employment, in the labor market, as apparently caused by abortion. So our ability to access legal abortion is apparently, in case you weren't aware, responsible for all of our achievements in the last 46 years. The problem, of course, is that when you go and you look at primary data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the Department of Education or um, the census on poverty, and you look at the rise and fall of abortion rates and ratios, and mostly the fall since the early 1990s, you see absolutely not only no causation, but no correlation even <laughs> with women's participation in education or labor market or women's poverty statistics, okay? Um, Furthermore, they insisted, insisted at least a hundred times across this, um, uh, uh, this testimony, and I not only looked at Vermont, but I decided to have some fun and also punish myself by looking at every line of uh, legislative hearings in New York, Illinois, Virginia, and all the interest group stuff that was put in there, and then categorize all their arguments into boxes, see if I could find any empirical data. The turnaway studies, again, the summaries of the blogs of the newspaper articles were one. <laughs> Uh, there was some legislator in New York who said that the Guttmacher Institute, you know, Planned Parenthood's former affiliate, now a pro-choice think tank and researcher, assured her that women feel great after their abortions. They really don't suffer. Um, and then they made claims that all late-term abortions, which they knew were controversial, are always because the woman's health or the child's health is in dire circumstances. Except the problem is that when the Annenberg Pub Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania and factcheck.org, which publishes in the Washington Post, went and asked the Guttmacher Institute, why do women have late-term abortions? They said there's really no good data on this. We think it's probably for the same reasons they have abortions at any time. <laughs> I mean, nothing, okay? Nothing. So I looked at the data on health, I looked at life, I looked at labor, I looked at jobs, I looked at educational attainment. There simply is nothing to indicate that women's progress is achieved or women's health is achieved because of abortion. I remember I was asked to testify before the House of Representatives in Washington on a conscience protection bill across all health care laws that had abortion as part of it. And I decided to look and see what the feds were saying about abortion as health care in the first place. I reviewed somewhere between five and 6,000 pages of White House Office of Women and Girls, Department of Health and Human Services, the CDC, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, NIH generally. And it turns out, in no place across the entire panoply of federal documents on women's health is there even one statement that abortion promotes a women's health. And in fact, when you go look at the literature, and even if you restrict yourself to literature written by uh, people who perform abortion or people who self-declare as pro-choice, they say things like, there's no evidence that abortion improves mental health of women. There's some evidence that it seems to have a harmful effect on women's mental health. I mean, I could go on. The bottom line is that 46 years into legal abortion, they are attempting to make the claim with these wild, general, conclusory statements that women's health and life is absolutely dependent <coughs> on abortion. And they have no reasonable argument, no data. 46 years, right, of an experiment with legal abortion and nothing really to say about it <coughs> that is factual. Nothing whatsoever. <coughs> what, today I had a further, I, I had a thought about what that means about where we are and then today I had a debate at Fordham Law School. Uh, I kind of, was, it's kind of ironic. I teach at a public university. I was there to present the pro-life case. Fordham, which I think still identifies as a Catholic university, their family law professor was there to present the pro-legal abortion. And I thought, wow, this is an interesting, I mean, interesting thing that's happening right here. And when I talked about what I had not seen in the empirical data, her response was, the empirical data doesn't matter. It's irrelevant to the debate about abortion. So whether or not it improves women's health or harms it is irrelevant to the debate about abortion. She said, All that matters is the woman gets to choose. 
To which, of course, I responded, but doesn't it matter if the choice is good for her or bad for her? And she says, well, they can tell her it's bad for her in informed consent, and she can accept that bad choice. But it is crucial that she gets to make the choice. And again, this reminds me of a famous Justice Scalia uh, footnote when he was contending with the, some of the other members of the court about how you find a non-textual substantive due process constitutional right in the Constitution, how five justices say there is one when it's not in the text. And he said, you can't ever declare that a constitutional right to do such and such exists without asking who is impacted and how. He said, it's like saying there's a constitutional right to fire a gun, but not asking if anyone is in front of it. I mean, vintage Scalia. And I asked the question, doesn't it matter if the women's health is harmed? Or if on the one side you have the value of human life, and on the other side you have no value for the woman at all, or maybe a disvalue, and the answer was no, that doesn't matter. So what I'm saying to you is this, <coughs> what words for willism, you know, autonomy as itself a good. And you not only see this in the abortion debate, but increasingly you're seeing it in the transgender debate, which is, it's not a question of whether, you know, the surgery helps or hurts, it's whether the person wants it. And um, you see it in the contraception debate as well. It's not a question as to whether there are long-term effects, whether it causes depression, whether it has social effects that have changed the sex mating and marriage marketplace, especially to the disadvantage of women, poor women most particularly. Um, that doesn't matter. It's a question of a person being able to choose it. And that's really where we are now. And so what we've, what we've always been contending with, but it is quite explicit now, is that our discussion of whether that really is enough for freedom. Or don't people actually vote with their free that freedom means relationship, freedom means sacrifice, freedom means love, freedom means generosity, freedom means all of those things. That it isn't simply about making a choice no matter whether it's good for you or destroys another life. I mean, we really have to present it because in those kinds of terms because that's where we are right now. The final thing I want to say I think is a much more hopeful thing. And Sister Bethany spoke about, you know, the trajectory of the pro-life debate and having women speak up about this in ways that give heart to other women and men, but the next generation, whoever they are. And I mean, we really are in a position now where even to have the opinions we have are considered hateful, right? and unacceptable. I was giving the Constitution Day talk at Louisiana State University and a random student called in, claimed he was uh, an LGBT student, claimed to the administration of the law school that I had said X, Y, and Z in such and such a book. Like five minutes before the program, the university pulled its sponsorship because I was unsafe. Right? Now another institute was sponsoring it, so I still went on. But then the young woman, who by the way, was getting her PhD like a week from then, like had no reason in her, <laughs> got up and started spewing, I had said this, and I made her feel unsafe, this, and I had written that, and I said, I'm sorry, I just want to step back. I've never written any of those sentences. I don't even know what book you're talking about. When she said, I said, that's not my book. I mean, and this is the grounds on which the school pulls its sponsorship. This is where we are. It's not about facts, it's not about reason. And this, we have to narrate in advance in order that people understand that we are about facts and reason, and that we understand that that's what will be beneficial to them, too. The, 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 the final thought is, is a happy one. I was at Notre Dame at their Right to Life group uh, last week, when were we two weeks, three weeks, whatever. And um, I have to say, and maybe you've had the same feeling, this Right to Life group, I had dinner with them, we had tremendous conversation. Between their degrees in neurobiology, psychology, physics, theology, philosophy, philosophy slash neurobiology, th there are many languages, races, countries. Oh my, they were amazing. And, and, and they're just this year's board. I didn't even have dinner with the whole, like 40, 50 of them. The, the intelligence. The, the training um, and the willingness to stand up in an academy. Notre Dame's a little easier than some places to do this, but the willingness to be who they were 
is it's out there and we can take great hope from it but I can tell you and I say this to each of you individually things are so dicey out there in the sense of having this opinion makes you a bad person that it is necessary for each and every one of us wherever we are to both be a beautiful person right you know bring Christ to that area for those who are <laughs> who, who are into that <laughs> And, and also to, to articulate our pro-life belief because we have to upend this idea that it is simply unacceptable that we exist and speak out. So thank you very much for this great honor. Thanks to Human Life Review and to all of you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, I have five things to say quickly, trust me. One, uh, Helen mentioned uh, Justice Scalia. I do want to make note that Justice Scalia did not get into Regis High School. Uh, the second thing, <laughs> those glasses, uh, as sister talked about Helen doing the glasses on the end of the nose and that looked very cool and I, I tried it but my glasses ended up in Yonkers. So, uh, third thing, uh, sister you left your ruler up on the head. <laughs> waka, waka, waka. <laughs> Where's Father McCartney? Where's John? See, I, was that, did I? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Be here all week. Um, fourth thing, Rich Lowry. Rich Lowry and I, almost 30 years, had uh, known when you were working for um, Charles Krauthammer, first talked on the phone, but when Rich first came to work for National Review, he came to work for me. And now he's Rich Lowry because of that. So let that, <laughs> let that be known. Uh, Catherine's going to introduce him, but I just I do want to say that Rich is a dear friend and has uh, a great capacity uh, for love. We have a mutual friend, uh, William, special guy, and and uh, the, the love I see Rich show for people is uh, just remarkable and very uh, touching. It's occasional, but it's happens. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last, last but not least, Catherine Lopez, who I will do the duties of introducing Rich officially. Just a few things quick. Uh, when I used to get in the office uh, six o'clock in the morning, and often there was a kind of a human life review crowd there. Catherine would be there. The late Mike Patemra, our great friend who helped edit the, the, the review, was there. Uh, Chris uh, McAvoy, who's here somewhere. Uh, Chris, okay, Chris was there at 6 a.m. and Russ Jenkins, who was supposed to be here but couldn't tonight. And it was all a great cabal of National Review folks, but they all had a great connection um, to the Human Life Review. Uh, we love the Human Life Review uh, at, at NR. Um, about Catherine, um, anyone follow Catherine on Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, Facebook? <laughs> First of all, if you saw somebody taking pictures in, in, with their cell phone and mask, you would think, uh, that person needs a uh, uh, little, uh, little this. <laughs> but Catherine is different. <laughs> there's something, I'm sorry, there's something very, very uh, holy about Catherine. Truly, and uh, when you're on Instagram ready, or not Instagram, that's a little nicer, but t Twitter, and you're ready to write some tweet to <laughs> tell someone just how he can go in the down elevator, you know where. There's a tweet from Catherine saying, please pray for the, and, and you're just like, wow, she just kneecapped my, my anger. Arr, hey, Catherine. So, but, <laughs> Constantly praying, never sleeping, because there's always someone to pray for, always someone to worry about. And she is just really one of the most special people uh, I have uh, ever met, I think, that any of us have ever met. And it could be a better person to introduce our, our dear mutual friend, uh, Rich Lowry. So Catherine Jean Lopez.
I wouldn't hug Jack because he made the ruler joke. <laughs> I, I, I told the end of our table that he was going to be in trouble if he, <laughs> he made the ruler joke. <laughs> Thank you so much all for being here tonight. Um, a number of years ago now, in, in 2012, um, I met Pope Benedict, which is usually the story that Jack leads with. He usually says I have a weekly papal audience, which isn't actually true, but that day Pope Benedict looked at me with the most loving fatherly eyes, so loving in fact that I, I couldn't help but think that I was seeing just a little taste of the splendor of the face of God our Father and his perfect love for us. I bring this up for a, a few reasons, one of them being that at that moment, he was handing me a message for all the women of the world about how women impregnated with the, the spirit of the gospel will help mankind from falling. Another reason being that since it was a message for all the women of the world, I really have to talk about it a lot every chance I can. I, I don't think I've delivered it fully to the entire planet of women. <laughs> and the main reason I mention it tonight is because we need you men too. I think women need to say that. And that's why it's a glorious thing that Rich Lowry has stepped up to the plate to do his part as editor of National Review to help mankind from falling or to stand athwart the free fall, yelling stop, to adapt our 1955 publisher statement a little bit. We stand athwart history, yelling stop, just a little. The Catholic Church talks about feminine genius. Sometimes I worry that sounds foreign to most people, too ecclesiastical. Until you meet Helen or Sister Bethany, and then you see it. Um, they embody it and radiate it and becomes contagious. You start to see feminine genius as not just a pretty concept, but a transformational reality in the world. You start that know, to know that women impregnated with the gospel can be in the world and what a difference it makes. I often wish we would consider to masculine genius. Pope Francis talks about the need to be more tender. This can't be done in families, in churches, in communities, in heaven help us, or politics and culture without the complementarity of men and women. So we can help one another live as God intends. I've known Rich Lowry for a long time now. I started at National Review shortly after my 21st birthday, and so that's more than half my life now, knowing Rich. So I can tell you that Rich Lowry has long had this masculine genius about him. You may see his byline and watch him on TV and hear opinions, but the conviction, especially on the gift, of, and, the gift and dignity of human life, comes in no small part from his quiet, tender heart that gives rise to a protective, loving instinct. It's a sharing in the sense of gratitude and stewardship that was a core part of William F. Buckley Jr.'s life and career. National Review wouldn't exist at its founding or now without gratitude and that sense of responsibility to be good stewards of the gifts we have been given and that most precious gift being life itself. It was so long ago now, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Rich was playing with our beloved now late Cato Burns' son, John, in the Washington office of National Review at the time photocopying hands and playing with plastic frogs, as I recall. Rich was just wonderful with an intensely shy boy. I watched Rich draw John out. I remember thinking then that Rich was gonna make a great dad one day. <clears throat> John, by the way, is a police officer now. And that tender fatherly instinct has directed Rich's life at National Review, and even before he became editor at the young age of 29. Part of the reason that Bill Buckley chose Rich as editor is because Bill was so impressed by the love Rich poured into National Review. It was years before Rich would meet his beautiful wife, Vanessa, but it was a fatherly love Rich had for this magazine he had read from his youth, hiding it in textbooks, like some boys might hide a magazine they shouldn't be reading, as he often jokes. <laughs> As a Washington reporter, Rich did his duties, he made his pitches and wrote his stories and well, but he also cared so much that he critiqued each issue in a memo to the editor at the time, John O'Sullivan, Johnny O, who we love. And Rich was always making suggestions above his pay grade in a welcome team player kind of way because the magazine had his heart and he was gonna pour his talent into it. 
and he has, and he does. I also remember, maybe even before I got to meet and work with Rich, I would see pieces he would write on various issues and challenges surrounding attacks on manhood. I had the sense he took that responsibility, being a man, seriously, even as a young man in his 20s. He wanted to understand it and live it, and do something about the confusion about it with the opportunities in his life. So of course, he couldn't keep from making the magazine by the example he set and the encouragement he's given, an environment he's created editorially and otherwise, a home for insisting on the defense of the most vulnerable. The obvious example to point out right now is our young, relentless, in the best of ways, Alexander De Sanctis, who has become the go-to person to check in on anything abortion-related in the news. She's such a beautiful young woman in radiant light, like some of the, so many of the young people we have at National Review. Even The Atlantic has asked her in the last year or so to weigh in on abortion, I'm not a friendly, known as a friendly pro-life magazine, um, from her unapologetically pro-life position. Speaking of Notre Dame, she's a Notre Dame graduate. At first, not long ago, truth be told, she was just out of Notre Dame, Buckley Fellow at the National Review Institute. I was actually worried for a moment someone might decide she was too narrowly focused on abortion. To the contrary, Rich regularly celebrates her presence at National Review because she's really made herself an indispensable expert. What a beautiful thing for life and when there is such extremism, including, as has been noted, this very state we have the dinner in tonight. And also, in the time of the Me Too movement and so many dark allegations, here we have such an example of how we ought to be treating one another in the workplace and encouraging one another and mentoring the young and fighting for what's right, using our platforms for good, for the beautiful, for life. And needless to say, it's not just our Zan, as we call Alexandra. One of my earliest memories at NR is being in the Washington office at a lunch with Rich and Kate and Ramesh Panuru and Justice Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas asked Ramesh for his Princeton thesis on Supreme Court abortion jurisprudence because it came up during conversation and he was so impressed. Ramesh has been stalwart. He set a gold standard for analysis, and Rich has wanted him to, putting many of his pieces and editorials on the cover of the magazine. In fact, the very first issue Rich put together as editor had abortion and child welfare items flagged on the corner, on the cover. That very first, it had a big Maggie Gallagher piece on daycare and an editorial on the 25th anniversary of Roe. When Jodo Goldberg's first book, The Fascism, was published, the excerpt Rich ran in National Review was about the eugenics behind Planned Parenthood and legal abortion in America. Kevin Williamson, born of a teenage mother who chose adoption just before Roe became law of the land, has had, uh, has had a powerful cover story on adoption. Kevin also had a cover story on Planned Parenthood on their 100th anniversary two years ago. So many of our writers have written so beautifully and powerfully and consistently and persistently over the years in defense of innocent human life, standing athwart medicine and biotechnology gone wild. I could go on and on. In fact, when I went to put this together, put together with Jack a couple of years ago, a National Review pro-life reader, I knew I would have a lot to choose from, but I was overwhelmed when I actually dived in, including remembering everything Rich himself has written on abortion over the years. I uh, long more than suspected that from being around Rich all this time and from some of his own writing and sharing that some of his love for life and this environment he's created at National Review as a lighthouse, as an Army, Navy, Air Force and Marines and also a field hospital on these issues has a lot to do with his own family life and his own encounters with the preciousness and fragility of vulnerable human life. We're reminded again how critical men and women together and family are to establish and building and rebuilding and renewing a civilization of life and love. Rich Lowry takes joy in human life. And you can even watch how he shares this in delighting in baseball, drawing people in on common ground to maybe someday consider the fuller worldview beyond the Yankees he represents. <laughs> oh, okay, there's no world beyond the Yankees, I understand. <laughs> and I've seen him play a pivotal role in conversion on this issue and in other fundamental ways. It works, relationships work. 
Thank you, Rich, for being such a good father, not only to your beloved Julia and Daniel, but to Bill Buckley's National Review, he wisely entrusted to you. And thank you, Human Life Review, for recognizing this masculine genius tonight, his commitment to human life as a priority in his own writing and as the oxygen in the air at National Review. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming and thanking Rich Larry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. I think it's going to be, I have to talk, about, talk to my speaking agency about making it a requirement to appear, uh, uh, when I appear at events, to be referred to at least once as a masculine genius <laughs> during the course of the evening. Catherine, that was incredibly uh, generous. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. It's such an honor to be here with you, to be honored uh, together with, with Helen. And I just want to salute the Human Life Review and everyone who makes it happen and especially the McFadden family. Uh, when I became editor of National Review um, way back in 1998, I was 29 years old, and very often I would show up at the office and there would be a typewritten uh, letter or memo left on my desk from Jim McFadden. And he was suffering from a very grave illness at the time. And uh, one of the great things about being young is that you're young. One of the downsides is that you're clueless. So uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't think very much about his reference to not being able to sleep. And this is why he was writing, uh, had the time to write these letters. And I also didn't really think very much about why he, suffering at three in the morning, would write a 29-year-old that he didn't know these long uh, memos about conservatism, about principles, about National Review, its history, about how to deal with, with Bill Buckley, and it just spoke to a, uh, uh, which is not a, always an easy thing, um, but it just spoke to a, a deep commitment to mentorship and to the cause uh, that uh, Jim represented, Maria, you represent, and your whole family and your whole team represent. So thank you for what you do. Um, so it's not false modesty, but genuine modesty to say I really don't deserve this award. I have so many colleagues who are much uh, more prolific and, and uh, consequential defenders of life than I am, beginning with Catherine herself, who not, not just advocates the cause, but lives and represents uh, the cause. And Jack joked about this, but it's really extraordinary to have someone, when our debate is so poisonous, who consistently is uplifting and inspiring. Uh, and everything she does, and that's Catherine Lopez. So thank you, Catherine. There's Jack Fowler, who's done so much and will do anything uh, for this, this cause, and is a dear friend of mine. There's Ramesh Panuru. Uh, Catherine mentioned incredibly incisive uh, pro-life writer. There's Alexandra uh, DeSanctis, also mentioned by Catherine, who if you don't know her yet, you will. She will be one of the, the fiercest defenders of life uh, in journalism, I believe. And usually when I'm writing something about a pro-life cause, I'm just cribbing from, from the work of my, my colleagues at National Review. But I, I do think there's one moment when I perhaps rose to the level of deserving this, this award. And it was uh, several years ago, I was at the Aspen Ideas Festival, speaking to a bunch of completely smug and insular and out of touch liberals uh, about a book I'd written about Abraham Lincoln. And it was going great. You know, like everyone loves Lincoln, everyone hates slavery, and um, they, they thought I was that most dreaded phenomenon, a reasonable conservative, and we're going through the Q&A section, and this woman stands up, I still remember it very starkly, and she says, I'm just curious, so what do you think is like the great scourge of our time, that like slavery is accepted now, but for decades from now, no one will understand possibly how it was accepted. And if you're like me, and you're into like pleasing any audience, Audience. This is like a moment of panic, right? It's like my mind was like racing. Around. How do I, how do I get out of this one? It's like plastic straws. You know, they're they're really bad. So you know, I, I considered it closely. I examined my conscience. I was like, there, there's just no way out of it. 
It's abortion. It's not even close. It's abortion on demand. And boom, right? There is not another mention of Lincoln at this event the rest of the time. We had a long and contentious seminar on abortion and abortion policy. And I did not go back to the Aspen Ideas Festival for years. And I was happy not to go back to the Aspen Ideas <laughs> Festival uh, for, for years. But the heroes of this cause are not those of us who write or advocates. They're the practitioners. They're people like uh, Suzanne Metaxas and her colleagues at Avail. There are people like our radiant sisters uh, here tonight who uh, exemplify that great statement we all know from Mother Teresa. You don't want your babies? Give me your babies. I'll take care of your babies. I'll love your babies. And uh, our, our friend Father Rutler tells a story. Uh, I don't know whether I'm messing it up or if it's apocryphal, but he was apparently charged once with meeting uh, Mother Teresa at the airport when she flew here from Calcutta. And uh, he met her and took her to the baggage claim area. And they stood there and they watched the carousel go round and round and round. All the bags were gone. And then finally, Father Rutler is, uh, you don't have any baggage? And she's like, no, I just thought you liked standing here. So. <laughs> So um, I, I've, been, I've been thinking about this, and, and what, what does the other side, what are those folks at the Aspen Ideas Festival, what do they not understand about us as pro-lifers? Well, they think we're moralistic. And to be honest, our cause is so righteous, we probably are occasionally uh, a little moralistic. They think we're judgmental. Well, they think there is such a thing as a legitimately unwanted life. So it's hard not to judge that. So maybe we are judgmental. But what they'll never understand about us is that we are joyful. And as Christians, we believe this is built in to the universe. The church is the bride. Uh, the uh, Christ is the bridegroom, which I'm not mistaken, implies a wedding, which is a celebration. And in fact, the first miracle by Jesus is at a wedding at Cana, where he... Uh, transforms the, the water into wine, not just any old swill, into awesome wine, into like, <laughs> like super Tuscan, like wine. And, and he does this after everyone at this celebration has drunk every last drop of the wine that they had uh, themselves. So this, this celebration is built into the universe. There's also crushing tragedy and grief built into our world. The fact is, and this is a very basic insight, but it never uh, struck me, at least not with the starkness until I heard a pastor say it several years ago, every human, every human relationship, no matter how true, no matter how long-lasting, no matter how loving, ends in separation and heartache, just necessarily, inevitably. But still in all, there's the marvel uh, of life, and no one is the same. Our distinctiveness is set right at the beginning, from the very moment of conception, when we're all endowed with a genetic package of information, unlike any that's ever been seen in the history of the world, or ever again be seen in the history of the world. So every very young embryo on a scan you know, might look the same, but that's only because we don't yet have the capacity to know him or her. And uh, one of my favorite psalms, besides 23, is 139, which if you haven't read recently, read it. It will stun you. And it goes to the fact that we might know, not know uh, this young embryo yet, but God does. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And as soon as the baby is delivered to us, though, we know we have something completely new, something completely different from his or her uh, siblings, and will stay that way pretty much no matter what uh, we do. And by the way, I've, I've been distracted all night by this baby. Is this gorgeous baby over here? If, if you want, what happened to the gorgeous baby? Where'd she go? Okay. That, here, there you go. Look at that. You want to know what we're what for? That right there, that is what we're about. 
So this distinctiveness, it, and I hate to say it, includes gender. Um, now, it's getting weird. I have two small children, and we live in, in Manhattan. Let me tell you, it's getting weird on the playgrounds of, of New York. Uh, just the other day, like a week ago, uh, I was out in the playground with uh, my daughter, a friend of hers, same age, like four, and our, our little son, who's two. And my daughter and her, her friend were pretending to be Sleeping Beauty and taking turns uh, being Sleeping Beauty. And um, my son, you know, wants to get on, in on any action, you know, so he wanted to be Sleeping Beauty. And my, my daughter, who's very common sense, goes like, no, no. Boys can't be Sleeping Beauty. And uh, this was such a, a shockingly retrograde sentiment to utter out loud in New York City. That, I'm serious. Her friend, her four-year-old friend corrected her. It's like, no, no, boys can be princesses. And uh, my, I wrote the essay I have in the current issue of the Human Life Review is about euphemism and the abortion debate, how the other side doesn't want to use uh, a frank and forthright language about what they're about. My favorite euphemism in a much more innocent context is from my, my daughter. And you, you've all had this experience with kids. You know, your kids get onto a word, and as soon as they realize you don't want them to say it, you know, it's all over. So she, a while ago, uh, learned the word stupid, um, and saying stupid all the time, and a little bit tongue-in-cheek. I wasn't entirely serious about it, but I started saying, no, don't say that word. Say ill-considered. Uh, so that... <laughs> So this had like the effect that you would think it did, like none, right? So she'd say, stupid, stupid, stupid. I'd say, no, no, ill considered stupid, 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 ill considered stupid, 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 on it went. And um, around this time, she was getting potty trained, and she had an like, incredibly successful uh, turn in the, the bathroom. The problem was, this was the, the morning, and she had this like absorbent pad we put in there, a diaper uh, to, you know, for extra insurance at night, and she threw this thing in, in the toilet, flushed it, and the whole thing like overflows. So um, I'm in there, I'm like uh, plunging, I'm mopping, I need like a hazmat suit, and my wife is like furious, you know, she's always tired at the end of her tether. When something goes wrong like this, it's presumed it's my, you know, discipl disciplinary failures that account for the situation. So you know, I'm in there like 45 minutes, and, and uh, Vanessa's like, you gotta talk to her, Rich, you really gotta talk to her. And she, she's, my daughter's sitting out and she realizes, you know, something, something's gone wrong. So I finally get, I clean it up and I come out and I say, I gotta have the stern conversation. And I, I put her on my knee and I'm like, Julia, what did you do? She said, Daddy, I did something ill-considered. <laughs> And of course, she totally got off the hook. I was so delighted. So, uh, so a decisive, and Catherine made a, a reference to this, a, a decisive influence in my thinking and attitudes about life issues is because my older brother, Robert, is autistic, not severely. Uh, he talks, but he doesn't drive. He can't hold a job, can't live alone can't have a girlfriend, although he thinks he has girlfriends, like lots of girlfriends. Um, the, the only person I've known in my life who more, is more enamored of blondes than my brother was, for better and mostly worse, Roger Ailes. I mean, it's, it's just Robert and blondes, you can't believe it. Um, but he laughs more than anyone I know. Uh, he has hobbies, he reads books, he has go-to places in the community, he, uh, he enjoys movies, he loves eating, he watches TV. Um, it was a funny moment, and this just should have been one of many signs I ignored about how things were going in 2016. For some reason, he was a Trump fan. Uh, he doesn't care about politics. And I, I was talking to him one night before one of the presidential debates. I was, Robert, Robert, what are you doing tonight? I'm watching the presidential debate. I was like, okay, I, I've never heard you say that before. And I, I was curious, I called him up afterwards, and I was, Robert, what, what was your impression from that debate? Hillary's a liar. So, you know, <laughs> Trump is like such an effective communicator. He got this uh, very important and true message through to my brother. But anyway, we, we all know someone like this from, from our, our own families, uh, from our friends, from our, our neighbors. And it doesn't take much discernment, really, like basically no discernment at all, to know um, that any scale of human worth that says a person like this, a person like my brother, is less valuable than me, than you, than anyone else, that that is obviously an odious and twisted lie with a strong whiff of sulfur about it.
And I mean, think about it. Once we go down this road, once we say that uh, uh, the standard of human value is intelligence, looks, earning power, desirability, if we want to take this all the way to its end point, all of us would deserve to die. And the only person on the planet deemed worthy of life would be Tom Brady, right? <laughs> so we're, we're not going to go. We're not going to go down this route. So, no, the only scale of human life uh, that accords with truth is an absolute one. That every life, every person, every moment is a treasure. And if you have any doubt about this, we are left a breadcrumb trail of grace about the importance of human relationships and love, even in the most trying and worst circumstances. It's the man with Down syndrome being friendlier and more considerate in the back of the plane when it's taxiing at LaGuardia than anyone around him and leaping up to help the ladies uh, with all their luggage. It's the victim of a stroke playing piano at an assisted living facility for a lot of people who are desperately failing uh, or are demented and standing up at the end and applauding himself and his listeners in a small moment of triumph. It's the shockingly unexpected tenderness and incredible intimacy of spoon feeding a loved one at the very end. Moments like this are definitive proof of C.S. Lewis's statement that the universe rings true whenever you fairly test it. Or as John Adams, our founding father, said in a letter to a friend, griefs upon griefs, disappointments upon disappointments, what then? This is a gay, merry world notwithstanding. So in sum, we know that, and the other side doesn't, and that's what separates the desiccated calculus of willful destruction from the adamant insistence on life as a source of relationship, of love, and of joy. Thank you very much. Folks, before we, we um, end this wonderful evening, uh, three, I get to end it, right, Maria? Yes, sir. Okay, and this is on behalf of the board. Uh, I think three things. One, um, but four things. For, to, to Rich and to Helen and Sister and Catherine, thank you for your, your wonderful and very moving remarks. We had a great evening. Two, sister, I apologize for my ill-considered prank. <laughs> Three, thank you, Rich. I, I'm Catholic. I didn't know about this thing called the, the Bible and the Psalms. I, I'm going to look into this uh, when I get home. <laughs> Sorry, bishops. <laughs> And four. Oh, we have the raffle up for the Super Jesus Tuscan wine. I think that's the brand, right? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. God bless you. God bless the baby.